Next, from Washington, D.C., we attend a panel discussion on criminal justice reform featuring Sheriff David Clark of Milwaukee County, former Attorney General of Virginia Ken Cuccinelli, and Pat Nolan, the director of the Center for Criminal Justice Reform for the American Conservative Union Foundation. This runs about 30 minutes. Our streets have never been more safe. The crime rates have dropped dramatically since that time period. And a lot of people say that the rhetoric on the left of the low-level, nonviolent uh, person put in jail for just having a little bit of marijuana is way overblown, that these are actually hardened criminals in jail. And as a result, our streets are safer. So we're going to have that debate today and how, and how, and how we should approach this um, as, as conservatives. So um, we've got a great panel. Um, we're going to start with uh, Sheriff David Clark, who's on the streets every day fighting these. <laughs> former, former Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli of Virginia, who's at the state level enforcing this. And then Pat Nolan um, with ACU. He's, he heads the Center for Criminal Justice Reform. He's been on all sides of it and has been an advocate for many people that have been caught within the system. Um, so what, how we're going to do this is I'm going to open up. Everyone's going to have a, kind of an opening statement, if you will. Of why, of how, as conservatives, we should approach criminal justice reform, or does the system not need to be reformed at all? And so, Sheriff Clark, take a take a, take the first stab at this. Thank you. Good afternoon, <laughs> folks. You're not being told the truth when it comes to this criminal justice reform and sentencing reform, and I've called it the three lies of criminal justice reform. The three big lies. The first lie is that this will only involve low-level nonviolent offenders. That makes up such a small portion of the prison population, either at the state or federal level. You would barely put a dent in the prison prop population if you just stuck with low level, true low level uh, nonviolent offenders. Lie number two, that will, it will reduce crime. You're smarter than that. Okay, that flies in the face of getting tough on crime over the last several decades and it has led to record low numbers of crime, violent crime, in your communities. Line number three, that it will reduce costs. Again, you're smarter than that. All this is going to do, at best, is shift the cost from the federal government down to the state level, because we know what the recidivism rate, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, being at about 67 percent, where Within three years, 67% of these individuals will return to criminal behavior. They'll now be put into the state system, and so we will be incurring the cost. So all I want to have out of this is an honest discussion. Let's tell people the truth. And if we're not going to tell them the truth, I'm going to continue to resist. Tom Cotton is right on this. Jeff Sessions is right on this. Orrin Hatch is right on this. Ted Cruz is right in opposing this, this, this Trojan horse call uh, criminal justice reform. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, I think you probably have a different point of view. I have a modestly different point of view, <laughs> yes. Uh, I appreciate Sheriff Clark and his perspective um, on, on many issues and, and on parts of this one as well, uh, because I do think uh, his comments are well taken when you think about just a broad brush applied to this whole issue. And unfortunately, that's what the left tends to do. Uh, I belong to a coalition called Right on Crime, and it's conservatives, and we want to be right. And the number one job of state and local government is public safety. It's number one. And I don't think anybody in this room is going to believe that anybody on the left thinks that's number one, except maybe in lip service. Uh, I had the role as Attorney General of uh, maintaining convictions we got in our localities, took that very seriously. Crime exists all over this country because evil exists all over this country, and it isn't going away. So how do we best deal with it? But how do we best deal with it with the limited tax dollars that we have? I think we can look to conservative states like Texas that have actually lowered their uh, budgets for public safety because they have reduced crime. 
They've had both of those numbers go down in Texas, and one of Governor Perry's great accomplishments was overseeing criminal justice reform in Texas. Over the last 10 years, they have reduced both their budget for prisons and their crime rate by double-digit percentages, both at the same time. And they didn't do it by just across the board reducing a sentence for everything. They did it by targeting with particularity those areas of their criminal justice system where they could significantly lower recidivism rates, the most important statistic in criminal justice, arguably, um, while maintaining public safety. And did everything they do worked? No, and they got rid of the stuff that didn't. However, they did come across a number of things that made their system better and more cost effective. And I will tell you that if you want to see success stories, this will not shock you, don't look to Washington. But look out in the states. And it's not the Californias and the New Yorks of the world, it's the Texas, Georgia, in the Dakotas. That's where criminal justice reform that succeeds, which includes maintaining public safety, is happening. And there, we have evidence to provide other states that want to look at this that can cost-effectively lower their crime rates and maintain public safety. Now, will we ever penetrate Washington with that kind of particularized thinking? Well, I hope so. Senator Lee certainly hopes so. Um, it's, it's worth trying in the sense that no one's beyond redemption and hope springs eternal, but we should work where we are in our communities and in our states to keep improving criminal justice from a conservative perspective. That is so important. We need to own this issue if it's gonna be done right. The left can't own it. We gotta own it. All right. And Mr. Nolan, your kind of thoughts on, on, on how this plays into the conservative movement. Uh, to put this in context, I had uh, the blessing of working with Chuck Colson for over 15 years. And he was the pioneer. He was the first conservative that said, why on earth are we letting <clears throat> the same bureaucracy that runs the post office run the prisons? They don't do either very well. <clears throat> and the recidivism rate that Sheriff Clark refers to is an example of it not doing it <clears throat> very well. At its root, crime is a moral problem. That's the difference between criminal law and the civil law. Things like rape, robbery, murder, arson, are inherently evil. You don't frankly need a statute to tell that. When Cain killed Abel, there was no law against it <clears throat> other than God's law imprinted on our soul that it's wrong to murder. <clears throat> Unfortunately, especially at the federal level, law is, the statutes have gone far beyond those <clears throat> basic crimes. We now lock up people because they're lobster fishermen and the laws of Honduras say you have to pack it in cardboard boxes, not plastic bags. They put it in plastic bags and did eight years in the federal prison system. U.S. federal prison. Pardon me? Even though it was Honduras law. Right. US federal prison. <clears throat> there was no U.S. law against it. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, we lock up a, an elderly man that in retirement grew orchids, and the bill of lading put down the wrong type of orchid. And he was put in prison for that. We have Gibson Guitar, a business that we all know and appreciate, those of us that <clears throat> like music. SWAT teams from the Department of Interior invaded their two plants. <clears throat> At gunpoint and in flak vests, they held all the employees and they seized <clears throat> wood use for the fretboards. Why? because there's an Indian, the nation of India, labor law apparently, that says only Indian workers can work on their wood. Well, India approved its shipment to Gibson Guitar. How were they to know what the Indian local labor laws were? And yet the federal government <clears throat> prosecuted them. And who knew that the Department of Interior had a SWAT team? Uh, you know, well, my goodness. <clears throat> and the reason for no-knock laws is because people might destroy evidence, mm -hmm. flush the drugs down the toilet. Well, 
were, were they afraid the Gibson employees were going to flush guitars down the toilet? Come on now. They didn't need to raid that. And yet this brutal attack on a business. Now, the interesting thing is <clears throat> the owner of the company contributed to Republicans. All his competitors did the same with fretboards. None of them were prosecuted. None of them were raided. But he was. <clears throat> now, the government has way overreached. We think, conservatives think, we should get back to basics. Robbery, rape, arson, mayhem. Those are the crimes that we should be going after. Prisons are for people we're afraid of. And yet more and more, we're filling in with people we're mad at. Just a couple of statistics. And I, I uh, admire Sheriff Clark so much, but the figures don't lie. Of, of those uh, in uh, prison, uh, in federal prison, not state prison, state prison or wherever violent folks are locked up. The federal prison, over half, are drug crimes. And of those drug crimes, only 14% were major traffickers. Why on earth are we going after street dealers? The federal government should be going after people that ship drugs across international borders and across state lines. Instead, the power of the federal government is used to go after people just trafficking, you know, couriers. Now they should I'm going to disagree with you here. Pardon for, me? I'm going I'm to interrupt. You. I'll let you okay. take your point. but I, Because I've got different statistics um, from, from the DOJ from 2011 to 2012. Out of the, six, uh, the 67,000 offenders, only 28 of those were prosecuted on drug possession alone. No, no. I so, didn't say drug possession. Oh, Oh, all right, okay. but, no, but I mean, drug, no. drug this, crimes. This is one of the but, problems, though, but, that but, I have with if this. If I could just with finish this. for a moment. Well, you've gone on for quite a bit now, and, and I just, <laughs> yeah. You said three minutes, I did three minutes, yeah. and I stuck to the rule. But now we're going to run out of time. But here, we can get into a battle of statistics, ladies and gentlemen, if you want, okay? The gentleman over here said, figures don't lie. Well, I disagree. I think figures lie and liars figure, okay? But let's, let's, Let's do this for a moment. Let's take away all the statistics. Let's take away all the rhetoric. Let's take away all the motion. Let's strip that away. And what do you have left? I'm at street level, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in the belly of the beast every day. And we totally dismiss this nonviolent drug offender, which is a myth. But you know what? If you're a struggling mom living in a slum or a ghetto city in the United States of America, and you're doing everything that you can to keep your kid away from that dope dealer standing on the corner who's out there every day and who is an influence. Do you know that to get that guy off the street for as long as we can allowed by law is a big deal to her? She doesn't care about statistics. Well, but Sheriff. She doesn't care Sheriff, about statistics. Sheriff, I grew up on Crenshaw Boulevard. I know about street level crime, all right? I was a reserve deputy sheriff fully post-certified in L.A. County at the second most violent uh, substation, the Lakewood Station. So I know about violent crime. But the reality is the federal system, not you at the state level, the federal system, and this is from the Sentencing Commission that has all the data, one quarter of those in federal prison for uh, uh, drug offenses had no prior history of violence. Zero. Now, they're getting mandatory minimums of 5, 10, and 15 years. I'm saying sentence them under the regular sentencing law. Reserve the mandatory minimums for the dealers, the, the organiz organizers. And yet the federal government, which is a bureaucracy, has only gone after the low-level folks, only 14% of the information. I'd like, to, I'd like, to, get, I'd like to get, I'd good. like to get Mr. Cuccinelli's thought on this because reducing mandatory minimums is, uh, it's, you know, it's being batted about in the Senate right now. Um, it's a big talking point for both sides. Uh, you've seen uh, the president grant clemency um, for a lot of low-level offenders yeah. that have been wrapped up in the system and that have over long sentences. So, how does that uh, kind of, what, as conservatives, what should our talking points be? Um, and is there such thing as this low? level offender that's been in the system for way too long that's been wrapped up by these mandatory minutes. Well, part of what I hear being debated is what is a low-level offender, yeah. and, and the statements each of them have made are right to, to a certain extent. And, um, you know, it doesn't help us on the right 
when you've got a president who really looks like he's walking people out of prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, if that's what criminal justice reform is, I want no part of it. And, but if we're going to control this, and I don't just mean the narrative, but if we're going to control the policy itself, then conservatives need to step up. And so we can use particularity and do the right thing, hit them hard where hitting hard makes the most sense. Um, but, but we only have so many dollars. One of the problems at the federal level is, if you haven't noticed, we're bankrupt. Uh -huh. And look at what states like California have courts ordering them to do. They are literally being ordered to open the prison doors because they don't have the money to handle their own system. And somewhere out there is a balance. Somewhere out there is a balance, but we should be trying to do it not just tough, that's a, that's a, a given, but right. Uh -huh. So where do we spend those mandatory minimums? I'd ask a question out here to everybody. Let's talk about the toughest one of all, I think, gun crimes. Now, most of you don't know, but just shout out a number. How many years do you think is appropriate to automatically give, plus the sentencing that'll go over it, for a, for a gun offense, if you deal drugs while using a gun, if you have, obviously, robbery using a gun, how many years? Just yell out some numbers. Let me hear some numbers. <laughs> I, I heard mostly single digits. I heard 50 over here. Uh, but it's 15. It's 15 years, mandatory minimum. And I'm as tough on gun crime as they come. Richmond was, when I started as a young political activist, was the murder capital of America in the beginning of the 90s. And part of how that stopped is exactly what you heard from Sheriff Clark. But it was, and it was using those mandatory minimum sentences. But they were three and five year mandatory minimums. And it was used to clean up the streets in Richmond. It was a federal state partnership. That mandatory minimum now is fifth. 15 years well, nobody, plus nobody their forces sentence. Nobody forces people. Nobody forces people to commit crime. That's All true. Right, we're talking about a behavior, a behavior choice here, and a culture change that's needed. You don't arbitrarily set prison population rates. It's determined by the crime rate. Okay. I totally and agree. And I, sure. I agree that conservatives own this issue of law and order. And I find it unfathomable that we would cede this back over to the left and to the Democrats by cuddling up to criminals and thinking that if we are smart on crime, which I really think is being stupid on crime, we need to be serious on crime so that we can continue to control this issue. And where we win it with the public, ladies and gentlemen, it's enforcing the rule of law. It's not having pity for the criminal offender. Well, my uh, kind of, kind of, kind of to, to that point. Nobody's advocating having pity. The reality, though, is the federal government is concentrating on the low-level offender. It ought to be going after the drug traffickers, the organizers. But only 14 percent are them. That's a 86 percent. The, 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 the statistics are there from the Sentencing Commission, which has liberals as well as conservatives but on Sheriff there. Clark, Judge Pryor is a conservative. To, to your point, though, and I don't think that any of us don't want to maintain our tough on crime stance. I like my neighborhood. I like that it's safe. I appreciate the, you know, the men in blue that are keeping me safe. But when you're having this ballooning prison population, and let's say all of these guys are bad guys, what is your solution to the rising costs? Because as a taxpayer, um, more and more of my dollars are being, are we going to build bigger jails? What, kind of, what's the solution to that? All right, first of all, when we say uh, ballooning prison population, it's a culture issue and it's a behavior issue because like I said, we don't have political prisoners in the United States, all right? These individuals have engaged in some violent and even property crimes. All right, and I'm not suggesting you take somebody on a property crime, a theft, a retail theft, and throw them in federal prison or even state prison. We don't do that. That's part of the myth. Mm -hmm. Do you know how hard it is to put somebody in prison in the United States of America? Ask any cop on the street how hard it is to get a case charged, to see it all the way through to actual custodial time. It does not happen. Prisons at the federal and state level are reserved for the career criminals who time and time and time again, five, six, seven, eight, ten times get caught, 
selling drugs. You want to call that a low-level offender? No, that is a repeat career criminal. And like I said, when you live in the ghetto and you're that single mom and you're working your tail off to keep your kid on the straight and narrow, but you know you have to send your kid out into that street and who's the first person he's going to run into or see the dope man, you find relief that we keep these individuals who, locked up. More and that's whose side, that's who side I'm going to stay on, ladies and gentlemen. Who, who's I more important to go after? Law-abiding citizens. Or, I have or the pity mule. for victims of crime, not the criminal perpetrator. So I, I just who, to, who's more important to go after? The organizer of the cartel or the kid I'd on say, the street who's going to be replaced selling the dope? Literally, before you, you, you got to work your way up the chain, I think, is what a lot of But the reality is, it doesn't work that way. It hasn't worked that way. People rat down the chain. Ratting up the chain results in people shooting you and kidnapping your wife and children. And so they rat down the chain, and the people with the longest sentences end up being the girlfriend who's got nobody to rat out. Okay. okay. But I, I'd like for somebody to explain to me the great crime decline of the 90s and, and the first decade of 2000 record lows of violence. How do you explain that but for the okay. fact that we got serious about crime, not smart about crime, serious about it, and started putting these perp, uh, crimi uh, perp perpetrator. criminal perpetrators behind bars. Now, when you talk about the cost, 50 billion I hear per year across the United States to run corrections agencies. You know what the cost of crime is per year? We never hear about the cost of crime. Rand Corporation did a study. 2010, it's the last year the study's been done. They estimated, and it's a very detailed study, the true cost of crime in the United States of America, $300 billion per year. When you look at funeral costs, hospital costs, you look at wages lost, you look at the more police you need, the more crime that you have, you look at the criminal justice prosecution, you look at insurance rates that go up, when you add all this stuff together, Google the, the, the study and look at it. $300 billion a year. If and how's it the current $300 billion working? a year, and we pay 50 in, in corrections, I would say we're not paying enough to drive down the true how, cost of how, How's the current system working? Dope is more available than it was 10 and 20 years ago. But violent Despite crime these, rates, I don't... Violent crime yeah. rates are down. But I, I, I wanna, they are I wanna, down. I Texas move. closed three prisons, saved $3 billion, and they did it by selectively choosing who to send to prison, those that are dangerous and violent, while the putting the low-level offenders in treatment. And their crime is at the lowest rate since 1968. Okay, I want to I kind of shift the conversation because we've talked a lot about um, the, the protecting the individuals and the, and, the cost, and the cost of that. But what about when you have, a, when you have a, a, an offender who goes into prison and then he comes back out, he does his time, comes back out, is on probation, and then what we see is that about 60%, and the, 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 the figures here vary, yeah. end up going back into jail. As a society, what can we do to rehabilitate these, is there anything that we can do to rehabilitate these offenders so that they don't go back into their life of crime? Because that's also raising the costs. Yes, um, a number of states, Hawaii has, uh, taken people at that point of their process and much more intensively overseen them. And at a certain point when they get good enough at it, meaning the, the, over, the people providing oversight, um, that you can actually cut into prison time and do it as oversight with lower recidivism rates uh, and for less money. So that has been attempted, but it isn't with the standard arrangement you have in most states. It's a much more intensive program. One of the things we often at, see advocated in our conservative states is, look, you can do these few things in your state and you'll spend less money, but you should put that money into rehabilitation, into case management, so you're watching these folks so that they have actual oversight, whether it's ankle bracelets, whether it's actual visits rather than checking in on the phone, those kinds of things. The more supervision, the more intense that supervision, and it costs dollars to do, uh, the, the lower your recidivism rates. And there are states that have done that, all kinds of states actually, uh, and have had success with that and saved money doing it. One quarter of people under correctional supervision are in prison. 90% of our spending goes on them. Three quarters 
of the, those under correctional supervision are in the community amongst all of us. And only 10% goes to oversight of them. That makes no sense at all. One of the things we've advocated is beefing up probation and parole so that the case officer can stay, stay in oversight with them, but also so they can make sure they're showing up for their anger management classes, so they show up for their drug tests. In Hawaii, which uh, General Cuccinelli talked about, a study was done of those that went through the HOPE project. New crimes were cut by 50% and missed uh, probation appointments cut by 68% and dirty uh, drug tests were cut by 66%. At no extra cost to the government, and in fact, less cost, but it's tough. The judge calls them in and says, we take our rules seriously. Now, you can live by the rules, and we'll try to get you drug treatment, addiction care, help you get job training. You screw up, you don't get 13 errors. Yeah. That time, that first time a drug, dirty drug test, you go directly to jail, but only 48 hours. And then they come back for the judge, and he says, now, are you gonna be a knucklehead, or are you gonna continue, you know, live with the rules? And that's the success they've had, that strict oversight and investing in that rather than letting them get away with 10 or 13 violations and then sending away for six years. Thank well, it, most, yeah. most uh, if you talk to probation and parole agents, they'll tell you that their caseload is just much too heavy. They're really not effectively yeah. supervising. They have a, mm -hmm. uh, a case to follow some individual and it really doesn't happen. I got a better idea. What we need to do instead of trying to undo ingrained criminal behavior, because that's what we're talking about. By the time these individuals reach prison, this is part of their DNA. That's why I call them career criminals. It's what they do. Before it, become, it becomes ingrained at a much younger age, let's fix the juvenile justice system mm -hmm. so those don't become yes. the future adult prison inmates. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, there's a number of things that have to, has to happen, have to happen, and it has to happen at the same time. First of all, and I don't have the answer for this one, I'll tell you. We gotta fix families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. We have got to fix families. Yeah. Criminal behavior starts in crime prone years, and it's usually, I, I think they'd say between 15 and, and 25 are your crime prone years. That's where we need to be more effective, not for the people in the prison system, but the people who have, have done some uh, minor transgressions, and you can see they're on a path to the adult system. And let's interrupt it there, it's gonna cost Fewer dollars to do that than to try to undo because you're gonna, if you talk to a behavioral scientist, they'll tell you it is very difficult to undo deeply ingrained criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there's been some uh, uh, projects that have tried and yet on a small scale, it looks promising. There are no best practices, by the way. There are promising practices, but Dr. Joan Petersilk, I think Stanford University, she, supports these criminal modif modification programs, but she admits, she says, you know what, when you try to reproduce them to scale, if you do them on a small scale, you can have some results that look promising, but as soon as you start to expand that within that population to try to do it on 100 and 250 and 500 people, she says the returns fall off. So we have to be a little more humble about our ability to change human behavior, but if you don't have punishment as a deterrent to crime is going to encourage people to continue. And at least we know this about everybody locked up in prison. They're not committing crimes <laughs> while they're locked up. Well, but actually, actually, they I've are. actually I've, there's more I've, dope available inside prison than, than not and, my jailers. And, not. Yeah. And, uh, well, well I've got, we got to wrap up for today. But yeah. as you can see, this is a very complex top, top, topic with a lot of different moving variables. And I think that if you want to learn more about it, looking at the case studies that are done in Hawaii as well as Texas, um, and the right site, um, the website Right on Crime gives a lot of conservative approaches mm -hmm. on how to on how to um, confront this issue when you're debating about it. All right. Thank All you right. guys so right. much. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.